don't know how we're going to put a bow uh, on this reckless love season, um, the story of God's amazing grace. And I know it's been a stretching time. I know it's been a time that some people have left um, almost angry at times because we love singing amazing grace. But if we start seeing the reality of grace, um, the old legalistic part of our soul gets all stirred up because even when we think that we're free in a place like this, we find out that we have all kinds of legalistic bones still in our body. Um, grace, what a game changer for humanity. Today I want to take the grace message and I want to turn it inward a little bit. We've been talking about God's grace expressed on humanity in incredible just mind-blowing ways, but today I want you to see how grace plays a significant role in your life. Those of you who say you're saved, you're set free, you're not wallowing in legalism anymore, but you're still trying to wallow in life, and you've got to see how grace plays a part in your everyday life besides just the fact that your sins are thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. I want to show you a passage of Scripture today that, that m most of you are familiar with. It's a, it's a sticky little Scripture, and it's a place that God is trying to give us something significant, and we've missed some things. This is Paul talking, and he's being very open, and he's being very honest like we're going to be today. He says, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ, and just to, just to take the mystery out of all this, he's trying to do this third-person type weird thing, and I don't know why he's doing it. He's talking about himself, and later on in the passage, he makes clear that he's referring to himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, which means the, the realm of God. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. Yes, you said that, Paul, but God knows. Was caught up to paradise, and he heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Now, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. In other words, He's trying to give God the credit for the, for the important things in his life, but he's admitting that within himself he's only weak. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited, now he's letting the cat out of the bag that this was him the whole time he was referring to, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me three times, which was Hebrew custom. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. I, I, I got to stop and back up because this is madness what he's saying. Because how many of us have ever said what this guy is saying? I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults. I delight in hardships. I delight in persecutions. I delight in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, this is a mysterious passage, uh, mostly in that Paul never really defines what this thorn in the flesh is. It is being kept intentionally obscure. I say by him and by God also, the author of this book. And people speculate, and there are little hints here and there of what it could be, and that's why there, there's really there's three primary 
theories of what this thorn in Paul's flesh would be. And by the way, if you don't know what the thorn in the flesh is, in Hebrew culture, it just meant an enemy. An enemy. Remember back in the Old Testament, God would tell his people, you need to go destroy this enemy. And when you go in there, destroy the men, the women, the children, the cows, the donkeys, the sheep. He said, go destroy it all. He said, if you don't destroy them all, they'll come back to be a thorn in your flesh. It'll be an enemy that just presses into your being. Well, there are some that believe that Paul's thorn was the persecution that he was referring to. What goes around comes around. It seems like God cannot be mocked, as Paul once wrote. You will reap what you sow, and it seems like that Paul, who was once the persecutor, is now the one being persecuted, and he's trying to stay on track with his mission. And every time he turns around, if you've read the stories of Paul, um, you know it's an endless list of persecutions coming against him. And so there are theologians that say that, that probably the persecution may be the thorn in his flesh that just will not go away. There are other people that point out little tidbits in Scripture that says it was a physical affliction. There was something going on in him. He makes some references about his eyes, that there may be something wrong with his eyes. And it was hampering his journey, his ministry. His, he thought it was hampering his call of God. And his thought was much like our thought. God, if you'll just fix it, if you'll make this go away, I can be so much better of a servant for you. I can be a better minister if I don't have this affliction, this infirmity in my life. There's a third very popular theory that suggests that Paul's thorn in his flesh is guilt. If you know anything about Paul, you know he was quite the oppressor. He was not a nice guy before he had his come to Jesus moment. I don't know if you've ever looked back on your B.C. days with more than regret, but maybe some shame, some embarrassment, and even some guilt for things that you've done. And you don't know how to go back and make amends and fix those things and make it all better. Was it guilt that was his thorn in the flesh? Was it physical affliction that was his thorn in the flesh? Was it persecution, conflict, adversity? What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Well, God keeps it obscure. Because God wants us to understand that the thorn in the flesh can be any of those things. Today we sang a song called My Redeemer Lives. I love the story of redemption. I'm afraid the story of redemption isn't always enough for we American Christians. And we add a lot of components to the story that was never intended by God because we are very fleshly driven in this life. We know we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. We know that we're trying to, 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 to live for eternity. But we are still so here and now with our mindsets. And so as pampered American Christians especially, we really tweak and twist Scripture and present it in a way with the the, the, the pie in the sky and the cotton candy and, and all that stuff where life is supposed to be so much better and so much easier once we give our lives to Jesus, redeemed. I want you to know the truth today. You have been redeemed, bought back, purchased from, we say from our sin, but technically, you have been redeemed, purchased back from yourself. Where you try to self-rule and own your own life. Redeemed means that now God has purchased us from ourselves. He now has the lease. He owns us. And we've been redeemed and we've been removed even though we still battle sin. It's not who we are anymore. It's not our identity. It's in Him that we live, we move, we have our being and I want you to know, though, we have not been redeemed from persecution. If we have, there's people in the other countries that we don't think about that are missing something very significant. 
Redemption has nothing to do with persecution. We've not been redeemed from conflict. We have not been redeemed from adversity. I know that some of us grew up in in, in, in church circles, especially coming up through the charismatic movement, where we put a very different spin on Scripture than the obvious context that Scripture was written in. We haven't been redeemed from problems. We haven't been redeemed from hard times. We haven't been redeemed from enemies. We haven't been redeemed from thorns in our flesh. Hold on. We haven't been redeemed from sickness. Oh, God's the God that heals our disease. He always was the God that healed our disease. And Jesus, God in flesh, made very clear that he's a compassionate God. He's moved with compassion and it triggers his power. He does incredible things in our bodies. The stripes that Jesus took, the wounds were for spiritual healing, however. And I know the American twist defies that. We don't defy God's healing nature. It's always been his nature. But the stripes he took, the wounds that Isaiah spoke of, was for a spiritual healing back to God. And as some of you have noticed, who love God, you serve him, you've given him your life, you do the best you can, and you are still battling affliction in your life. In the old days, some movements would say, well, there must be sin in your life. How cruel to dare tell anybody that. And how ignorant to tempt God in such a way to do declare that somebody's affliction is because of their sin, lest you find yourself in those same shoes. God loves us and he heals our bodies. I've experienced miraculous healings. Every time he fixes one thing in my body, something else in my body breaks because my body has not been redeemed. My body is made to fail. My body breaks to remind me to stop living after the flesh and start sowing for the eternal. Now, don't sow where moth can eat and rust can, can eat away the parts that the worms can even eat away. We haven't been redeemed from an endless number of enemies in life that come against us. Paul is wrestling with this because Paul, like us, is thinking it should be different now that I've had my come to Jesus moment. I have battled some of the mindsets that I believe Paul was Battling, and I want you to hear me. Spiritual maturity does not close the door to thorns. I've had many conversations with many pastors through the years, going through many battles and just wrestling with, well, I'm, 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 I'm giving him my life. I, I've, I've forsaken everything, all these sacrifices. Why is this happening? Why is that happening? It's so unfair. Yeah, it is, baby. Life is unfair. And if it's unfair to any group of people on planet earth, it is unfair to God's people. If anyone knows persecution outside of America today on planet earth, it is God's people. Paying horrendous prices for their faith, though they be redeemed. Spiritual maturity does not take away adversity. You can't outgrow conflict. You can't outgrow persecution. As many of you have learned, you can't outgrow sickness. I have declared things over my body and seen amazing things, even to the point of what I would put it almost in a miracle category, and then have other things in my body that just dog me and won't go away. Or to leave, it'll come back. I know all the practices. I know how to quote Scripture and declare the truths of God over my life. I know how to stand in faith. I know how to endure through some things. But when the smoke clears, I am sitting exactly where Paul sat. When he said, I'm sick of this thorn in my flesh. It needs to go away. 
custom in Jewish culture was to cry out three times for anything. And if it doesn't happen, then you're supposed to start looking at plan B. What else is going on here? What's God trying to do? That's not American style. Man, we will exhaust ourselves, exhaust ourselves trying to get God to change something in our life. Rarely stopping, putting everything on pause, and dare say, God, what is the bigger picture? What are you trying to do in my life? If you've been here on Wednesday nights for our sovereignty of God and man's free will class, boy, you should have a big picture view of life now and how the individual things going on in a human being's life plays into the big picture of God's sovereignty. Spiritual maturity does not make attacks go away. It doesn't make conflicts go away. It doesn't make enemies go away. In fact, spiritual maturity often opens doors for new testing and development of greater faith. I know that's not the American version of this story. Our culture, not God's word, our culture in America teaches that we deserve the best of everything. And we infuse it into our theology. And when we get anything less than pie in the sky, we start stressing and we're, we start doubting and we battle condemnation and we try to figure out what we're doing wrong and what we need to do different and what we need to do harder. Maybe if I pray harder. How many's ever been told you just need to pray harder? Thank God for grace that is bigger than having to labor and work and pray harder. It's exhausting. Paul tried to pray his thorn away, just like we do. In fact, if we stop and we, we ponder just for a moment, what percentage of our prayer life is consumed with trying to pray away thorns, what would that percentage be? Praying away the sickness, praying away the job, praying away the husband, praying away the wife. Exhausting ourselves, laboring, praying harder, trying to learn new prayer techniques, getting on 10 more prayer chains, trying to change our financial picture. We're confessing more than we've ever confessed. We're declaring more scripture than we've ever declared. Why is this not changing? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with God? Maybe God's trying to show us a better story, a better picture. Paul said, I have cried out, I have prayed, take this thorn away. And God's comeback is simply my grace is enough. Now, that's a nice little Christian catchphrase. My grace is enough. His grace is enough. We declare it in other people's lives all the time, whatever they're going through. Well, brother, his grace will be enough. But what does that mean? Well, if you grew up in church, you know that grace literally means unmerited favor. The unmerited favor of God. Favor of God in your life, even if you can't pray harder than what you're already praying. I'm trying to set you free today. It's a favor of God that is bigger than whatever the thorn is. Some of you would say, Pastor Scott, I ain't got a thorn problem. I got a thorn bush problem. They are poking me everywhere I got skin. When God comes back to Paul and says, my grace is sufficient, He's saying, Paul, I know. I know you don't want this in your life. I know that you think you'll be better off if this is not in your life. I know that you believe at this point you deserve for this not to be in your life. But I'm telling you, you need to learn something. My favor in your life is bigger than whatever the enemy is. How many here has ever been falsely accused of anything? And you tossed and turned multiple nights before you exhausted yourself and just couldn't think about it anymore, 
or you grew to a point in your faith where you finally learned just to give it to God and leave it alone because you came to a place where you understood His grace is enough, His favor. I have God's favor in my life. How big is that? How big is God's favor? I don't like this story because this story tells me that if there's an absence of thorns in my life, that on some level there will be the absence of God's grace in my life. Everybody wants to see God's grace in everybody else's life. We want to see grace in our life when it comes to our sin. But this story is not a story of grace and sin. This is a story of grace and all hell coming against you in life. False accusation, being lied about, whatever the enemy is. Adversity, persecution, conflict, that's broad stuff. Attacks in your body, attacks in your mind. His grace is bigger than the thorn. His grace is bigger than the enemy. His favor is bigger than the adversity. His favor is bigger than whatever comes against you. There are four things I thought about this week very quickly thought about. That God's grace in my life, God's grace in your life, and again, I'm talking about the grace that goes beyond covering our sins, accepting us as we are. I'm talking about the daily operation of God's grace in a real world in our life. It's four things that I realize that this grace needs to be in my life to remind me of. And for this grace to be in my life, I realize there's going to be thorns in my life. The first thing that grace reminds us of is that God is present in our thorn bush. How many ever felt alone? I'll tell you, I felt alone. You want to feel alone? Take my job for a while. I, I've been watching uh, on Netflix, Designated Survivor. Anybody ever watch that? Does it give you a new appreciation of people that are having to be in positions like the president, and we all think it's so easy out here second-guessing and, you know, armchair quarterbacking everything and gives you inside glimpses of things going on. When he first got the job, which he wasn't supposed to have, and I... If you haven't watched it, I sure can't fill in all the blanks. But he was made to understand this will be the loneliest job on earth. I'll bet you there's a lot of people at different times in their life that they feel that exact same way. I felt that way as a pastor before, coming under attack from some things that I couldn't really talk to other people about. Anytime you're in a, in a, in a position in life where you're in leadership, you're always going to uh, have people second-guessing you. Uh, People don't like how you're doing things and telling lies on you. Things that you have no way to defend. Some things you think you do have a way to defend. And the Spirit of God is saying, leave it alone. Leave it alone. If you take up for yourself, I won't take up for you. But if you leave it alone, I got your back. That's hard to do, by the way. It's easy for me to tell you to do that. It's hard for me to do that. Every one of you have, in your marriage at times, you felt like you're the loneliest person on the planet. You've come under attack. You've been in situations you didn't even really know who to talk to about. You didn't know if anyone would understand. You just kept it all inside. You felt so alone. God's grace is supposed to be the reminder that God is there. When we start seeing, when we'll just relax and start seeing His favor begin to play out in that thorn bush, it reminds us that God is there. God is there. How disturbing to ever think for a second that we're in a bad place in life and God is nowhere to be found. But if God is there, His grace reminds us that He is there. The second thing that His grace in our life reminds us of is that God loves us despite the thorn bush. 
Grace is the demonstration of God's love. You say, well, I thought it was the work of the cross. Yes, grace is the demonstration of God's love. The work of the cross was the work of grace. Grace is the demonstration of God's love in your life. God isn't going to come in here with a physical body today outside of the body of Christ and give you a big hug. He's not going to set you down using any voices except for the voices that you're familiar with to, to, to counsel you and to, and, and to comfort you and say some things to, to keep you going. But His grace somehow reminds us that He loves us. But we have to see it play out. And that's what God was trying to do for Paul. Take a deep breath, Paul. Stop talking about the thorn. I want you to see that my grace is going to be sufficient. My grace is going to be bigger. I want you to see that I'm here with you. I know about the thorns. I'm, I'm with you in it. I want you to see that I love you. I love you. I love you. The third thing that grace reminds us of is that God is bigger than our thorn bush. Oh, i got to read this. Look at this, Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say in response to this? And he's been talking about how God foreknows us and he predestines us to become his children. He said, God is for us. Who can be against us? Well, you know the answer, right? Everybody. Everybody can be against you. Everything can be against you, seen and unseen. Some of it because you deserve it, and some of it you did nothing to bring it on yourself. You were just standing there minding your own business. How many of you guys have learned that sometimes you're actually doing something good, and doing that good thing pushed a button, and the floodgates of hell just opened against you? And you're trying to figure out, what did I do wrong? It's not always because we do something wrong. Have you read the Bible? I don't like the stories in the Bible. I like the American version of the Bible stories. I love this. They're very romantic. They're just tales of intrigue and just heroes. And, but when you actually read the stories, you see there's stories of human beings kind of minding their own business till God shows up and says, Hey, I got a plan for you. How would you like to be a prophet? That sounds good. I remember the days, some of my older days, everybody wanted to be a prophet. Everyone wanted to be an apostle. None of them had ever read the Bible. I guess they didn't know that being a prophet was probably the loneliest position in the body of Christ. But it sounded glamorous. It sounded heroic. Stories of the Bible are filled with people who are battling loneliness and enemies and conflicts and adversity. But God was there. They become great stories because they're stories of God being there and God loving people and God reminding people, I am bigger than whatever comes against you. If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, let's itemize. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Through what? Through grace, unmerited favor, the favor of God. It's all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Well, everybody will actually. doesn't matter because God justifies. Who are they compared to God? Who is he that condemns? Everybody. Well, Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God. And he's not condemning you. He's actually interceding for you. Well, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, everything and everybody is going to try. Who shall separate us? Who, how will we know that we're not separated? Because His grace, His grace is going to become tangible in your life. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, can those things separate you from Him and His love and His grace in your life? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, 
neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, no thorn, no thorn bush, no thorn patch can be bigger than God's love, God's grace in your life. Last of all, grace reminds us that God has a plan for you in that thorn bush. And that's not the part we used to preach. We knew it was in the Bible, but we avoided those. We've read passages about God's sovereignty and studied in the last few weeks that, that as charismatic type people, we, we often skip over. We, we love that God brings prosperity, but we hate the concept of God bringing disaster. Would a good God ever do such a thing? God's sovereignty will open up your windows and you'll see a view you've never seen before that actually will not trouble you but make you relax as you're reminded that God's got this. He is in control. God's grace reminds us that he has a plan going on for us in the thorn bush. It doesn't mean that God always was the one that, that pulled the thorn off the branch and rammed it into your heel or into your side or wherever. If you've been here on Wednesday nights, man has free will. They get to make all kinds of decisions, and a lot of them are bad decisions, and sometimes you get caught in the ripple effect. There's a lot of angry people out there, unhappy people. There's a lot of mean people out there. And sometimes innocent people get caught in their crossfires. And what shall we do in that situation? How will we stand? How will we make it? if the grace of God in our life is not bigger than those people's decisions. God has a plan going on for us in the thorn bush. He's growing you up in the thorn bush. He's building your faith in the thorn bush. He's keeping you humble, as he said to Paul, in the thorn bush. He's reminding you how strong he can be inside of you in the thorn bush. He's developing a walk with him in the thorn bush. Those are the things that we all want, we pray for, we cry out for, we preach about, but we don't understand that most of those things take place in the thorn bush, not while we're laying out on the beach of life getting a suntan. It is through conflict and adversity. It is through having to face enemies. It's having to, to stare giants in the eye. These are the things that, that hone us and carve on us and, and build our faith. These are the things that, that humble our flesh, just like it did with Paul. God's grace reminds us that he's there. He's present in the thorn bush. His grace reminds us that he loves us despite what we're thinking about that thorn bush. His grace reminds us that he's bigger than the thorn bush. His grace reminds us that he has a plan going on in your thorn bush. So there he is. They have stripped him. They have beat him. The one who has come to redeem humanity back. Purchase them for God. Buy them back from their own bad decisions. Buy them back for their own destructive self-will, self-rule. He's come to redeem humanity. It's a good thing. We should be happy. We should celebrate. But instead, we strip him bare and we beat him with a whip. And we prepare to take him to the cross to crucify him. An action which will be the action of redemption where a grace covenant will now be cut. One of the most obscure things that happens in this redemption story is when they take a crown of thorns because he has been declared to be a king and they think that's quite humorous. And they weave a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they press it into his brow. They thought nothing of that other than it was just mockery. It was ridicule. We can read about it and see it as nothing more than just 
another painful, terrible thing they did to our Lord. But to our Lord, it meant a great deal. That was his way of saying, I'm going to take all of your thorns upon myself. I love that they pressed him into his head because the very head of Christ, the Lordship. He's saying, I, I will lord over these thorns. I will take them upon myself as I cut this grace covenant with you, which is more than just grace to cover your sins. It's a favor in your life that will be bigger than anything that ever comes against you, anything that ever attacks you, any enemy that ever raises its head against you, my grace is going to be bigger. I'm going to take these thorns. I'm going to wear them. I'm going to let the battle become mine. You just let my grace be sufficient. That's all you have to do. How big is your thorn today? How painful is it? How aggravating is it? How much is this thorn in your flesh invading your soul, consuming your life, taking all of your thoughts, all your ponderings? You can't sleep at night. You're tossing and you're turning and you're trying to, to figure out a plan and you're, you're working hard trying to hear from God and you've got advice from 10 different Christians and you're going down the list and you're punching the list and you're, you're doing, doing all the things that you think you can do to make it better. You're working hard. You're praying harder. You're reading the Bible longer at night. You're, you're, you're declaring more scriptures over yourself than you ever had before. You're in church consistently. You decide you're finally going to lift your hands and worship. What else can I do? Well, stop doing. Learn to let His grace be enough, sufficient. Learn that His grace, His favor in your life is bigger than the thorns. And if we can get this revelation, we are going to relax. And we're going to finally start enjoying our life instead of being American Christians who can tend to be the most unhappy Christians on the planet. Isn't it weird? And I've been to, to more than a dozen other countries, several of those countries, um, people being persecuted for their faith. And it's always amazed me the joy I find in the body of Christ in other places compared to here. And yet we're the most blessed, the most pampered, the most spoiled. We have our weird twist on the Gospels and what the work of the cross is supposed to mean for our life. We think that it means make all the bad stuff go away. But it is a grace covenant. Not a, I'm going to make it all go away covenant. Not I'm going to hold you and I'm going to, I'm going to rock you, baby, and I'm going to give you a bottle and I'm going to wrap you up in a blanket and I'm going to protect you. That's the American gospel. Ain't nothing going to get you, not on my watch. I'm, I'm God. I'm right here. I got you. You're my child. Meanwhile, back at the God gospel, they were sawed in two. They were boiled in oil. They were thrown to the lions. They were shipwrecked. They were beat. They were stoned. And they saw God's grace in ways that the average American Christian will never see. His grace is bigger than your thorn. I want you to stand with me this morning. I want to pray for us. How many of you guys would say, Pastor Scott, sometimes you preach stuff that I can't relate to. But I can relate to thorns. Can I see your hand? Who all would say you got some thorns right now that's pressing into you just a little bit? Can we pray together about that? Why don't you just come up here with me? I got some thorns too. So, well, Pastor Scott, what are they? You're being awful obscure about your thorns. I know because it doesn't really matter what a thorn is. Bottom line, when the smoke clears, it's a thorn. It's a thorn. It's an enemy. It's something that won't go away. How many of you guys have ever tried to develop bigger faith to make bigger thorns go away? 
If y'all ever get sick of living under law, come join me. Because I ain't doing it anymore. I'm tired of laboring with my prayer life. Yeah, I've got a prayer life. I've, I, my prayer life is, it's, it's not just essential. It's a, Joey needs on up here. And uh, I felt him looking at me like I could do something about that. <laughs> could y'all push the keyboard so on, please? Don't make me come back here and be a thorn in your side. Because I can do that from here. Um, guys, the prayer life is very important. The biblical prayer life was meant to develop relationship with God and stand in the gap for others. We exhaust ourselves with our prayer life trying to make our thorns go away, our problems go away. And I know that it's going to take time to renew our minds, but we are expending our walk with God trying to make our life better. Have you ever noticed that if you fix one thing, two things break the next day? Have you noticed that? You think, well, if just this one thing would go away, my life would be fine. And that thing goes away eventually, because they usually do, and then your life is fine for at least three or four days. And then you step on another thorn. I'm telling you, we've got to stop use, utilizing all these tools of Christianity to try to fix all the broken things in our life and make bad things go away. We've got to start learning how to use the tools of Christianity to deepen our walk with God. Using it in evangelism and winning the, the, the world to Him and, and, and just standing in the gap. And we've got, to, we've got to relearn how to do this for our lives doesn't mean you can't ask God for anything. You can ask Him for whatever you want. You're His child. You're His baby. Ask Him for whatever you want. But then don't fall into that pit that when it doesn't happen, you start battling condemnation. Well, I'm not good enough. I'm, there must be something in my life that i got to get cleaned up first. Dudes, if God's not going to move in your life before you get everything right in your life, what was the point of the cross to begin with? You can't get everything right in your life enough to move the hand of God in your life. It can't be done. You can't get holy enough. That's why we're presented to the Father in the holiness of, our son, of the Son instead of our own holiness. You're never going to be holy enough within yourself. You're never going to be good enough, clean enough, righteous enough, mature enough. Guys, this is a grace thing. It's a grace thing. Daddy gave us grace, unmerited favor. He said, you're going to have days you're going to be a good kid and days you're not going to be a good kid. Got any kids like that? Yeah. I'm not going to start because I'm not paying you today. You're breaking me up on Sunday mornings. Grace, what an easy word to say. Grace, what a somewhat easy word to understand in connection to our sin. But taking grace into the deepest places of our soul that Paul was having to learn about, where every day we learn his grace is enough. His grace is enough. Well, what if I can't fix that? Doesn't matter. His grace is enough. What if that doesn't go away? Well, his grace is enough. Well, I'm sick of battling this thing in my body. If it would just go away. Well, what if it doesn't go away? Some of y'all are going to get great healings. Some of y'all are not going to get great healings. In fact, you're all going to die of something eventually. And I don't know if you're going to be perfectly healthy when you die. There might be something wrong with you that caused the death. You, you understand what I'm saying here? I'm trying to help us get perspective on life. And the only thing that brings balance our sanity to any of it is coming to a place of grace revelation where the foundation in our soul is his grace is enough. His grace is enough. I didn't, couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. On most of my days, I do not deserve his grace. Thank God it's grace, unmerited favor. Whatever's going on in your life right now, stop beating yourself up. Stop exhausting yourself. Stop laboring. Today, come to a place of rest and peace and breathe in the truths of God. His grace is enough. 
Father, today, by the power of your Spirit, accomplish what I am very feeble at. Lord, I, I have no power to convince anybody of the truths of God. I am not a good enough orator or preacher or teacher to, to make people have supernatural epiphanies. This has to be a work of your spirit today, to take words that we say all the time, sermons that we have preached more than once through the years, passages of Scripture we have read dozens, if not hundreds of times. It's only by the power of your spirit that you will take all this now and turn it into fabric in our soul, foundation and rock that we build our lives on. Today, Lord, draw us into a place that nobody wants to operate in. A place being okay with being weak. So that we can come into the revelation knowledge that Paul had. For when we are weak, now we understand you are strong. Guys, I just want to remind you, that's where he's trying to take us. When you're weak physically, when you're weak emotionally... When you're weak, just your relationships are falling apart and you're just, you're weak mentally. You feel like you're weak spiritually. That you will learn the beauty of when you are weak. Now he can be strong. I was telling the praise team going back there to pray this morning. I said, I said, boy, it's good to have a Sunday here where almost the whole praise team is here. I sure miss, miss that saxophone today. but and, and, and I told Clint, I said, but the truth is, some of our most powerful worship experiences is when we're just completely discombobulated up here at the la last minute, having to play musical instruments, and we don't know who's going to do what. And in our weakness, the presence of God swells up out of that, and people are moved, and they tap into His presence. And The sermons I've been the most confident about preaching, I've got no more. And people going out the door going, oh, thank you, Pastor, that was nice. Well, I'm good. I'm glad that was nice for you. Some of the most powerful things I've ever preached, Jeff, was after some of the worst weeks of my life. Even sinful weeks. Yep. B, I know that shocks you. I am a sinner saved by grace. When you are unusable, that's when he will make you the most usable. You feel like you're weak, and if you could just get these things fixed in your life right now, then you could get on course, and boy, what you could do with your life. No, you couldn't. You can't. It's essential for you to be made weak so he can be made strong in the demonstration of his grace, his favor in your life. How many have a good opportunity to put this into practice this week in your life? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. You smile at your enemies. You pray for them. Nothing about damnation or <laughs> fireballs or hailstones or brimstone or anything. Be, pray nice things. And start enjoying your life. Did you ever notice if something bad doesn't go away and you finally come to terms with it and you just accept it, how much better life is? It doesn't mean that we're not going to pray away some bad things. It doesn't mean we're not going to rebuke some bad things. We've got to learn spiritual warfare. We've got to learn, but, but I'm telling you, the foundation of spiritual warfare is first learning that God's grace is sufficient in your life first. I've been telling you for weeks, grace has to be the fundamental foundation in our life before we ever build anything else on it. There are other things. Grace has to come first. All right. Let's see if I'm done that, did that. Got a couple Facebook messages I need to respond to. 1136. Do you all even know how to wrap your minds around what a great pastor I am? <laughs> to, to preach a full message, full-blown worship service. My wife's always up there doing announcements almost as long as I preach because she's just good at what she does, man. I told her, don't worry about crying so much. I like it that she cries. 
It's kind of a little balance when we go home and she just hollers and screams at me all the time. <laughs> Not really. She never does that. <sighs> to let you out at 1136. That's grace. <laughs> That's grace. I love you guys. See you Wednesday night. Thank you.